Herzlich willkommen, Freunde, hier bei Afrika für Allmanns Namibia. And a very warm welcome, of course, as always, also to our English-speaking audience. Today we are going to go really to the essence, I think, of, of this series, which is dealing a lot with the relations of German Namibians and also of the youth in, in both countries. And for that, I'm very honored that we have as a guest with us today, Honorable Mrs. Um, Ina Hengari, who is a, a young member of parliament and on that behalf also bridging a lot of these uh, topics that we are facing with the young people, facing of course also German-Namibian relations. Um, thank you for joining us and of course as always, Chandra Finis in the house. Welcome, welcome with us Chandra. Thank you, yeah. thank you for having us. So, um, Honorable um, Ina, I may say, um, yes. um, maybe just to give us a little um, introduction. Um, how do you see the, the, the status quo in, in Namibian-German relations as a, as a member of parliament? Well, I think, speaking from a youth perspective, and it's important that sometimes we also break it down to the younger generation to really understand. I think when it comes to german uh, Namibia relations, you would see that we still have a long way to go in terms of um, bridging the gap between information sharing between the two countries, especially intergenerational dialogues, having those dialogues between the two countries, not just between the elders, but also including young people in those very important yes. conversations. Yes, very much. And would you say that, I mean, I always struggle with, I mean, I, I did this podcast predominantly in Germany, and now thanks to Shandri, we are here in Namibia. Um, I always struggle with explaining why should they actually really care? Out of, out of your perspective, why should young people in Namibia or even in Germany care about the relationship between those two countries? Well, look, um, international relations in essence generally is very important because we're not just looking at cooperation between two countries. We're also looking at information sharing, opportunity sharing. So it goes beyond just um, the international relations, uh, theoretical, uh, but it also goes beyond, for example, look, um, Namibia wants to raise funds for youth development. For mm -hmm. well, that's a typical example, really. Um, they can pull money or funds or resources with Germany to help in different aspects of young people. Young people obviously should care because we're talking about development in all aspects, whether that funding goes towards you know, education, uh, building centers or infrastructure meant to bring young people together, uh, whether it's for educational purpose, purposes or just building libraries in essence, or even just developing stadiums. I think this is how we should see as young people and how we should understand international relations. You, you went to Germany recently, uh, yes. towards the end of last year. Can you tell us a bit more about that and your interactions while in Germany? Well, I was invited um, to speak at uh, a dialogue that was happening. They organized a dialogue between members of parliament from Germany mm -hmm. um, and also businessmen and women from um, Germany. Uh, and we were invited to really go and discuss in essence what does Namibia expect from Germany mm -hmm. in this bilateral relations. Um, and one of the most important things that really came up was uh, perhaps we must start looking at Namibia um, outside this veil, beyond these lenses of donor, donee, mm. you know, we must begin to ask questions. Instead of asking questions like, you know, uh, what does Namibia need from Germany? Perhaps we should also ask, what can Namibia do for Germany? Yes. I think that is what really the essence of that. And that's quite interesting. I, I'm, I'm very interested in this idea, mm -hmm. and Frederick knows we've been discussing this. How do we level the playing field more? Yeah. Can we really develop an equitable relationship? between Namibia and Germany. What are your thoughts on that? I think it depends on how you look at equity, mm -hmm. right? Um, we have a historical past, most mm -hmm. African countries, that we must recognize. And that historical past has placed us on a different scale compared to Western African countries. Yeah. Or Western countries, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and so, really, um, I think if, to build a sustainable and equitable relationship, mm -hmm. we must begin to look beyond um, a donor and domain. We must... Uh, you know, stop looking at African countries as, you know, the receiver mm -hmm. and go beyond that and look at really how can we partner up? Mm -hmm. How can we become sustainable partners? Uh, and it goes beyond really having this conversation, by the way. Mm -hmm. It also goes beyond um, having policies in place. At the end of the day, we also want to see implementation. We want to see the result and how most of this um, policies and decision, key decisions that are taken in boardrooms, how they translate uh, to the ordinary person on the street. And uh, among these different fields, where do you feel the most confident about that things are going well currently and maybe 
Which, which areas would you see or would you like to see more improvement? Well, I think uh, we need to provide more op or platforms. We need to create more ah, safe perfect. platforms. Yeah, we platforms are. like this, <laughs> uh, where we are able to have a conversation about ideas that yes. you hold, for example, that I hold um, as, as a young Namibian. Uh, I think that is one thing that we can do better because most of the conversations that you've seen, whether it's on the 1904, 1908 genocide, mm. take place in a hall somewhere in Berlin, take place somewhere in Ventuk in a hall. And we really don't bring um, this crucial information to the ordinary people on the ground. Um, another thing that I think is very important is um, the language. You know, um, how many of our schools, or how many of your schools, for example, um, teach Namibian yeah. languages, or how many of your schools in Germany teach about genocide? And not just that, even here in Namibia, how many of our schools really go beyond just, uh, no, there was a 1904-1908 genocide, and actually delves into the history? Um, I think I was quite privileged to be in Berlin, because um, I had the privilege to visit the parliament. And I mean, it's, it's quite interesting that in Germany, the parliament has an aspect where it's like a museum. Yes. So you have um, a, a range of photos. Yes. It's like a storytelling. It's part of your history. And I think that maybe I can do better in that aspect. And I think we both, I mean, that's what I get, especially now here in, in yeah. Namibia, we both, as, as people with a history, we both struggle to dig so deep to, to find that common time we had together, right? Because mm -hmm. as a German, at least, like there was this giant uh, independent struggle for United Germany. Yes. There was the Second and First World War, yes. which was leading to immense amounts of re-education and also sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And only behind all of that, yeah. then you find maybe this colonial relationship. And from my outside perspective, I don't know, maybe Shandere, mm -hmm. there's also much more stuff which happened afterwards, right? That yeah, you yeah. still struggle in education and uh, still have to deal with. We, we have this issue where this lack of engagement almost on yes. this history, right? And yes. on what happened from the German side, whether it's German Namibians living in Namibia yeah. or whether it's Germans in Germany. Mm. Uh, and the descendants of the genocide, the victims mm. of the genocide, yep. sort of have to live with these realities mm. on a daily basis. Yep. Uh, Frederick, maybe you can start on this one. How do we rebalance that to, to be able to ensure that all stakeholders inclusively understand and participate within this process. Mm -hmm. uh, from my understanding, at least, is that here you are so sensitive about it, not because only of the genocide, but because of the economic implications, right? That yeah. oftentimes when we spoke also now in, in Swakopmund to, to people, it was mostly that they were speaking about the consequences of the colonial times. And I think we don't in Germany speak a lot about consequences of those colonial times, because if those economic benefits were there, for sure it was nothing as... Um, visual, visual with land taking or with people actually murdered. Mm. So I think the, the implications are very, very much more nuanced in Germany to understand what they did. I think it, ha it has a role in understanding, for example, of things like the Shoah, yeah. of things like systematic um, extinction of, of people based on social, being at social criteria like in the Soviet Union or then racial criteria like in Nazi Germany. Mm. And I would wish that we could think a bit more about that. We could maybe in Germany, you know, we have this sense of a certain singularity of the of the Holocaust, for example, that you are not allowed technically, it's not a law, but like you should not engage too much with justifications and stuff. But I think mm -hmm. this here really holds, this, this genocide event holds a, holds a tool set to reflect and to, to think about how could such an event become true, you know? No, I'm, not, I'm not justifying it with anything. I'm not saying it's, it needed A to have B. But mm -hmm. I think it just, it opens a debate that is very painful, yeah. but, but it, it, it helps you a lot also with understanding your own country. Because, you know, maybe you notice it, yeah. many young Germans especially, they just distance themselves from the country. They, they, they don't want to have to do anything with the good and the bad parts, you know? Yeah. And I think that's what's something I'm very impressed always here. But do these, like, conversations happen in Germany? Like, as, as young people generally, do they happen? Do you meet up and and this, ha this conversation happened. We are in a very privileged audience. I think people who are so curious about Africa that they would listen, listen to, to this podcast for sure have a sensitivity. But in, yeah. the, in the broader German debate, I think especially relative to the, the crimes in Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. um, it, it is still a very, very small, small debate. And yeah. uh, I think oftentimes it's now only seen through this economic lens. Yes. But, but for us Germans, I think it has also a sort of historic lens that we can understand our own history better, you know, and um, despite acknowledging, of course, the, the, the crimes that, that came to it. And uh, that is something, I mean, um, uh, leading perfectly to my next question, 
Um, well, I think um, it's interesting yes. for your question. Yes, I think it's interesting that you say that. I, I wanted to find out because on our invitation, um, when I was in Berlin, you know, members of parliament were quite, they came out quite strongly about this genocide issue and wanting to uh, um, reach an amicable solution and end to the negotiations so that we can move forward and heal as two countries that have, you know, had to share this very yes. painful past. Um, how often do members of parliament come out like to the public and engage also in these conversations? Does it happen or is it something that just happened between, you know, members of parliament in Germany and um, maybe when they come to visit to Namibia, then only then does that a conversation happen? I think, I think it's a, it's a ra rather new thing. It, it did catch, catch some waves in, in 2021, I think, when yeah. the official reconciliation started. Yeah. But now I, I think the domination of German and Namibian relations is clearly with lying with green hydrogen because, you know, that's yeah. something everybody yeah. can feel. And Young people nowadays, I was actually at least lucky, I had a lot of contact with my grandparents, at least yes. I had some context to those times, you know, to the Nazi, uh, uh, Nazi generation uh, or the witnesses of that. And uh, I mean, there's nobody who gets in, in touch with, with the genocide, but maybe, maybe you here have some more of a, of a memory, a collective memory that you mm -hmm. to keep these things up. But I, I feel like in, Ger in Germany, if it's not true, things like these exchanges or maybe also the, the but trials. But people here need to live with the trauma, right? Uh, yeah. Of course, in Germany, it's implicated. On, right? yes. yeah. The remnants of, of the results of the genocide is still something we live with. How do we, in a, um, while these conversations are taking place, these formal negotiations, green hydrogen, all of these other things, but on a psychosocial level, in America, yeah. especially as young people, right? Yeah. How do we adequately deal with this trauma yeah. that we still have to live with? That uh, specifically, and then I'm very um, adamant in terms of the economic factor, mm -hmm. the fact that large sections of the economy is still controlled mm -hmm. by this community, the German Namibian community, who are yeah. direct descendants um, of colonialism, mm -hmm. and land specifically, this question of ancestral land and, and land that people have lost through that process. Well, I think, listen, uh, the onus is about, is on us as leaders of our country, mm -hmm. even if as young people, mm -hmm. without a position, this is what I always mm -hmm. say, you don't really need a position to be an influential person in Namibia. Yeah. We, are such we are such privileged people to be of such a small population mm -hmm. and it, it, it creates um, this opportunity for you to be heard. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it's really upon us as leaders in our community, number one. I think for a very long time, especially government leaders, we've had an opportunity to use the existing policy, policies mm -hmm. to address those trauma. Yeah. Because you know, when you talk about genocide, um, and like he said earlier, uh, we speak about more about the economic consequences that the genocide has had. Mm -hmm. We have spoken about how uh, people were, were displaced from uh, where they lived, how they've lost their cattle, lives were lost and so forth. And then we also speak about how this has affected those communities. Yeah. But I think it's important that we also recognize that, you know what, sometimes we have, in this 32 years, have had an opportunity mm -hmm. to use policy, to use laws, to ensure that at least um, there is some sort of re uh, redistribution of land, uh, there is some sort of reconciliation that is also happening. I think a community that we tend not to talk about as German, Germans living in Namibia mm -hmm. who are born here, I think that conversation has not been created. It has not ha happened. It's mostly state, German state to the Namibians. The Namibian the Namibian people, state. Right? But, and, or it can be German state and uh, the affected communities. Mm -hmm. But yes. it's never, it's never the, German, the German state with the Germans here and also the affected communities. Mm -hmm. uh, but in dealing with the trauma, mm -hmm. I think it's important to bring these communities, especially the Germans living in Namibia mm -hmm. and the affected communities, under one roof to really see how do you feel about this? Yes, you know, yes, this yes. has happened. Mm -hmm. Because most young people say, ah, you go around and uh, most farms are owned by Germans. Yeah. Uh, we don't own anything. But I am sure there is also a sense of uh, ownership that those Germans feel mm -hmm. as having been born here mm -hmm. in Namibia, um, as a Namibian ID uh, or card carrying um, and national, nationals, mm -hmm. um, people who have been born here and have built their lives here, um, have married here, and their parents have also uh, done the same in the past. Yeah, and I, 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 what I find also fascinating is that especially those demographic groups who suffered from the genocide, right? I mean, in all these negotiations, it's, it's predominantly Nama and Herero, mm -hmm. which, which were um, disenfranchised now, even until today. But um, they don't seem to be easy to directly address now with this, right? I mean, if yeah. you would speak to the state, that is everybody. That's also even the German descendants. If you now, no, you, don't, no, you no, disagree? No. I, I need to clarify you there that 
the, 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 the conversation around genocide yeah. is targeted and affected communities. Okay, but okay. So even in, in the initial rounds, there were certain regions and communities. But regions, you fight. don't have. I, I mean, you don't have separation into ethnic we, regions, we right? Do, it will always be. So it will always be. If you understand the history, apparently did that specifically. Of course, but yeah, that they moved people into regions in order to separate them even further. I understand. So you find the tribal groups are located within specific. But Chandra, we are not living in apartheid anymore. Okay, but yes, so it's not about this. So you know, it's it's so interesting. It's and exists, and so it, it, you need to get that idea yes. that it still exists. Of course, the reality still. But I'm just wondering, can you can you tell? Target the ones yes. that were disenfranchised back then. What yes. about the ones who are not even here anymore? What yes. about the ones who lost the land and are now gone in other countries? Into Botswana and yes. so on, we are addressing that. As well. and, and, and I think it's quite important to refer back to the motion mm -hmm. uh, of 2006 by uh, the late uh, chief of the Wahero people, yes. Kwaimari Rako. Mm -hmm. That, in that motion, if you read it, mm -hmm. I think it's a 13 page motion. Right? He speaks about the role that government should play in these negotiations, mm -hmm. in this process of uh, reconciliation, bringing back together Germany and Namibia and making sure that we move together um, in one accord. And he says he felt that government should should play the role of a mediator. Mm -hmm. A mediator. Not an actor. Not mediator. an actor, not okay. a main actor. And that is what most of the arguments, you know, that have been going around, and that is why... Um, most people will come up with these arguments to say no, but we've not been consulted, and because the initial motion of 2006, uh, the, the late paramount chief of the Wairo people made it clear that government should mediate, the state should act as a mediator between, you know, um, the Germans and the affected mm. communities. Yes, yes. But that is where we went wrong, and that is where we there's so much conflict right now, because. On, on one hand, you have um, communities, the affected communities, exactly. and their chiefs, their traditional mm -hmm. chiefs, saying, you know what, uh, we've not been involved in this process. We've not been consulted. And I think it also goes back again to the definition of uh, consultation. Yeah. What does consultation mm -hmm. mean? Is it you having engaged the German government and bringing information to us? Or you taking us into Amendment. the same room mm -hmm. at the same table to have a discussion mm -hmm. and having you there as a state, um, as a mediator mm -hmm. in that context? Well, yeah. no, but I, I think I, I, that clarification needs to be made because Frederick's argument is a typical German argument, right? That, oh, we, we should focus on development aid. Germany has disproportionately invested into Namibia since independence yeah. as opposed to every other country. And therefore, even with the genocide negotiations, we need to, uh, we need to look at um, the country as, an, as large and so on. And I find that extremely problematic yeah. because well, it, it is possible for us to identify where these communities are. Well, and it is possible it's, it's to possible. have targeted interventions because of the way Namibia is set up yeah. to address the needs of those communities Absolutely. instead of a wide range of, of developmental issues, which is something separate that development cooperation can continue. Mm -hmm. But on this specific issue, restorative justice, just like it was done to the Jews, well, yeah. specifically, must be done specifically but, to those I mean, affected communities. Again, it's a it's a it's a thing that happened a very long time ago, and as we have discussed even in other podcasts, there has yeah. been already through apartheid been done already so much change to even existing inequalities, extending, reducing, changing new people mm -hmm. that I, I would always say it is highly complicated to address those groups. If there's a mechanism, very nice, and I would like to go into that deeper. But let's maybe also then focus before we go on the uh, in the second half a little bit more on the on the youth in that role. And uh, for that, I wish you guys a little break, and then we come back. See you soon. Mit uns bist du on air. Pool Podcast Agency. Deine Stimme in der Welt. Welcome back, guys. Wow, that was a quite high energy first half. I thank you for that. Um, just you know, to clarify, maybe before I get to, into the next controversial question, um, of course, I don't, I don't want to justify the, the German state perspective, but I try to reflect a bit. You know, I have my ear on the podcast streets and see what, what young people actually in Germany also ask as questions about this um, reconciliation thing. And something they often address is, of course, we covered that, if you can target those groups. And the second thing is, you know, these groups are not the dominant ethnic groups anymore, right? In, in Namibia, the majority, if I'm not uh, mistaken, is uh, Oshibambo and others, which then in theory do not um, be, become included in this deal. Is that common or are there also some, some frictions between those different um, stakeholders in Namibia regarding this deal? Because you would assume that from colonial rule, everybody had some impact, right? And not only maybe the ones directly involved in the genocide. 
Well, I think uh, a nation, if you look at it as a nation, from a nation building perspective, yes, um, yes, you understand that the consequences also, you know, roll down to all other tribes, you know. At some point, other people were so involved in fighting back, um, in availing resources to these affected communities and so forth. Uh, but I don't think that should necessarily take away from the fact that there were those main groups. Mm. Those main groups were there. Uh, the, 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 the order was quite clear. It's not as if it said, no, um, the, the whole of Namibia must die. Or like it was targeted. Yes. It mentioned those groups. Had it been like a more general order, you know, then would obviously one could argue that mm. way. But in terms of nation building, because we want to move forward in one accord as a one country, and in that process, in the reconciliation process, you must ensure that although we talk about um, retribution, example, for example, for this particular mm. affected communities, you also in, you must include. There must be an aspect that also includes the rest of Namibia, mm. because you don't want to just develop one section of, of your country. You want to ensure that at least everybody, when it comes to nation building and national development, everybody is included in that package. Interesting. And, and what's the awareness? I mean, you as a young Herero, also of course, in this case, it's very interesting to ask you maybe directly yeah. how do you and maybe your fellow um, young um, colleagues um, of the Herero tribes, how do they see this development currently? Are they still worried it will not come through, or what? What are the current uh, feelings there? I think the the general feel right now is that um, there is a distrust between the young people, especially from the affected communities, yes. and the state, the Namibian the, state. The, the Namibian okay. state. While one, there's that argument of we've not been included as a shareholder or affected communities uh, or descendants of the victims and so forth. So there is a lot of distrust. And that is why you find that when the state sends their negotiators to go into a room to negotiate on behalf of our people, you'd find that sometimes they say, ah, but what did they talk about if they came out, if this is the result mm. from that negotiation? Did they really go and represent us, as, particularly as um, our interest as affected communities, or did they represent holistically yes. the interest of Namibia? Is there like a spokesperson? Yeah. I mean, how, how, how can I imagine that? Is there someone who is actually um, a, 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 or like representing basically the entire groups and then there's the, the following structures? Do you have like a, a form of hierarchy for yeah, this absolutely. purpose? Yeah, uh, Every traditional authority is formed in such a way that there is a hierarchy. Um, you have... Um, elder men and women who sometimes even take up the role as traditional chiefs um, or just uh, head men in that particular community. And they're usually um, form part of that leadership, the leadership of that particular community. And you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in the system that we are, you would expect that the envoy that is appointed by the president directly mm -hmm. will also form some sort of council with these traditional leaders um, to so, so as to ensure that it's not just about consultation. So it must go beyond just bringing the information. There must be an envoy of people, of representatives, mm. from these traditional chiefs, from these elder men and women, carried into the room so that they are able to witness the negotiations, but not just witness, also uh, be able to actively contribute and participate in those talks. I, I, I want to go a little bit into youth development and really how we can stay away from reproducing the same narratives about the history, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then my next question to you basically is, how do young Namibians and young Germans um, forge a new alliance ahead mm -hmm. and, and, and move into this new zone? Well, look, first of all, everybody wants to move forward. He says, you know, it's, it happened a long time ago, mm -hmm. let's move on. You say, you know, it has <laughs> had ramifications. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, young people, all of us want to move on. But uh, for young people that come from these communities and that, that have seen the stories, that have heard the stories, and by the way, myself, even growing up as a child, my grandfather, because I was raised by my grandfather, he would tell these stories. But beyond telling these stories, he carried the marks mm -hmm. of these stories. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather survived a bullet shot, for example, during the war. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that I had to see even growing up as a child. So I think it must go beyond just storytelling. Yeah. We must share this history mm -hmm. and also accept it as part of who we are. Mm -hmm. yes. Whether it's uh, Germans living in Namibia or German Namibians, and just Namibians coming from these affected mm -hmm. communities, we must begin to accept this shared history as part of who we are so that we are able to forge a way forward. 
It's very interesting, I think, also in terms of the, the voter base, because when I compare statistics in Germany, you know, the, the biggest group of voters is the ones above 70. Yeah. And every year you can actually see how that translates in policy, you know, like people uh, will be much more hesitant in Germany to change their retirement system, for example, because, yo, these are my voters, hey? don't, yeah, don't yeah. mess with these guys. And uh, here I see the, the biggest voter base is the one uh, below between 21 and 30, I think, or between 18 and 30. Mm -hmm. And um, I always wonder, does that really translate then into, into policy? Do you feel like or, or maybe can you take part in that um, that they are, that they are, that the priorities of the youth mm. are translated into politics well I think and this is how I'd like to look at youth empowerment um, just the, the other day I was having a conversation with someone and I was telling them that you know it was a conversation about Sadek and I want to use that example so because uh, it's much easier to understand mm. um, so as, have, SADC just for the context yeah, so southern, it's a southern African uh, uh, development yes. community so it's a southern African countries yes. um, and you have presidents right you have a president from Namibia mm. you have a president from Zimbabwe from South Africa and so forth mm. one of the things that we've really come to realize is what if we want to ensure that this regional organs are strengthened we must go beyond just um, advocating for a democratic transition in only one country, yeah. right? We must ensure that that principle of democratic transition applies to everyone across the board. So if your constitution says every five years there must be an election, that election must take place. Let me come back to what you're asking. I don't think it's enough to have five people in, in parliament, mm. right? I mean, you guys have a lot of young MPs, right? Yes. You are one of them, and I think many others. You, you yes. mentioned patients also. Yes. And um, I mean, that's a good sign, right? That's yes. a good start. No, it is a great start. But this is the thing. Yes, you have young members of parliament um, who serve as parliament now, and they are young, and they contribute. There is um, lively debate and all that. But I think it's important that when we look at empowering young people, we give them not just the safe space to operate, uh, a safe space to ensure that they're able to share their ideas, their ideas are accepted, and they form part of policy making, but also ensure that they have the tools of trade. And I'm not thinking about laptops and all that. IPhones. I'm thinking about, no, no, not, not iPhones. <laughs> um, I'm talking about research equipment, um, equipping them with the necessary support to really ensure that when I'm talking about a policy, for example, on youth unemployment, I don't just rely on Google. I'm able, I have the resources to go mm -hmm. into a rural community, assess and see this particular issue for myself. I don't think that has happened. Mm -hmm. We so have the capacity of yes. young MPs to be able to perform their work yes. but, present young But how MPs. many of these young MPs hold any form of office? Like what is the executive use in the media? Like one, is there? Is there? Okay, one, yes. Okay. And, yeah. And even that is the deputy position. You know, okay. we're talking about having real influence, having a seat at the table. Yeah. I think that should be clear. Yes, we love that we have embraced this idea of having young people in office as members of parliament, as deputy ministers and all that. But it is important that we begin to assess the work that they've done. How effective has this representation meant or been um, to their constituents? And uh, what has really been their advocacy? Has it translated, you know, good um, or has it translated for the young people uh, and, and the rest of those that they represent? And I think another um, misunderstanding and something that we must clear up is that, you know, sometimes we expect that as a young person, you must just go and talk about young people. If you're a woman, go and talk about uh, menstruation and uh, not having access to pads and all that. I think it's important that we move away from that narrative. I would want to see a young person who's able to talk about and articulate the issues of the economy. Mm -hmm. um, I would want to talk to have women at the table who speak about foreign affairs. So I think it's important that, yes, it's important um, young people in positions, does it translate into development? That's great. But also, what are we doing to actually broaden their, their spectrum so that they, they can be effective in other spaces? I, I find it interesting that in our dominant narrative, it's always young people in positions of political power. Mm. Do we keep the private sector in the movie to the same standard? Mm -hmm. How many, for instance, how many uh, bank boards yeah. or bank senior managers are young people yeah. um, in, in, in the private sector. Do you think that this, we can draw... Yeah, but there's that? a difference because the political sphere needs to represent its country, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you cannot force... I mean, ideally, of course, that would be nice, but from my understanding, a senior position requires X amount of experience in years, but I would hope at least that in the parliament and in the people who take decisions, that should be the representation 
of the youth, right, or of the of the country, which in your case is a very demographically youth mm -hmm. country. And uh, so I wonder, is that valid to ask? No, definitely. I think it's an interesting question. I think it is because I think that if the majority of the population is young people, and if if we, if we have now a lot of unemployed graduates, yeah. Right, If people are not making space in the private sector... Well, why yeah. are they not making their own private sector? Why are they not making their own, I don't know, companies that address young people, which will then shift Because to those? The Where's the disruption? Where's the disruption? Monopolized by yeah. those that have done it for years, those families that own these big companies yes. and that are able to control the economy. So I, I, my personal feeling is that in as much as we have this focus on representation, because... The same could be said for governance, right? Yes. Governance also needs experience. Governance also to needs some experience. extent, absolutely. So, but but if there's a 32 year old somewhere in a company, why must they wait until the age of 55 to be able to ascend to a managerial position mm -hmm. instead of being able to do it now? If they have the competency yeah. to run the country in terms of a governance perspective, then that competency should be able to Trust translate you. into to run the private sector. Well. And I think it's quite an interesting point because mm -hmm. I remember that. The private sector is the biggest um, industry or say sector mm -hmm. that actually absorbs young people, mm -hmm. right? They are the biggest employer. But that's how it should right? be, right? I mean, they, are, they, they are part of the biggest contributor even to the GDP. Yeah. That's how it you should know, be. It's not public enterprises that do these things. Most of the, the, that comp contribution or a big chunk of that contribution comes from the private sector. So why then, um, I think it's an important question and I think it really goes back to policy. Mm -hmm. How many policies do we have in our country that says or that requires that incentivizes, uh, incentivizes um, companies that employ young people mm -hmm. to say, if you employ a ratio of, a certain ratio of young people in your company, government incentivizes you, whether or prioritizes you in a, in a tender process mm -hmm. or a bidding process uh, or, something. or something. Yeah. So until we've come to really implement that, and I thought our amendments to the procurement uh, law was going to do that mm -hmm. and, and, and really find a way to bridge the gap between the private sector, the general population mm -hmm. and government. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe it's my, my um, bias coming from Germany where we have this concept of auto-liberalism, which basically yeah. means the state sets the framework yes. and inside that framework companies move free in the sense that they are in competition and whoever uh, performs the best mm -hmm. succeeds. But to be fair, to some extent, it still continues if you look at the big companies in Germany. I mean, Mercedes-Benz is not uh, in the last 10 years or it's, it's yeah. more than uh, older than the genocide even, you know, it's, it's, it dates back very much. And I'm always struggling with... Um, how do you get these young people who are dynamic? And here in Namibia, I see it especially, you have so many young, gifted people, technology, um, uh, able. How do you get them to get active themselves? I mean, you did it to some extent, right? Do you, you became politicized and went in there and uh, at Poli least now secured Politicized? A, I mean, <laughs> obviously you have an MP. You, did, yeah. you, you didn't uh, get forced to do that, I hope. Yeah. Um, so um, how do you think that could happen also to others? What, what, what does the public or even the structures need to change to, to get more people to at least get into MP positions or even into, um, into the private sector to a higher level than possible? Well, I think everything is about creating an interest. Um, if you talk about youth involvement, it's about creating an interest. If you want young people to get involved in decision making or to dream as far as wanting to be president in the next five or six years, you must create that interest. And creating an interest actually also involves being able to um, allow people to dream and inspiring people to say, if this person could do it, I can actually do it. If this person can be an MP at the age of 21 exactly. or 20, then I can actually do it. And I think it also goes, it speaks to the, the art of mobilization, you know. Um, and, and earlier on, when we were having our conversation, he said, um, it's during a crisis that an interest is built. Yeah. Most people would want to take part in a demonstration, uh, want to take part in an election, if there's a crisis that affects them mm. directly. Now, if, for as long as people don't understand that, yes, there's a crisis, and they don't understand how it affects them directly, they will never participate. Mm -hmm. But if we say, for example, take the youth unemployment rate, mm -hmm. it's over 50% over in our 50%. country, wow. right? And for as long as young people don't understand how uh, youth unemployment and those statistics actually represent them. So the 2% or the 50% represent an individual, mm -hmm. a livelihood, a house that could have been built, um, a family that could have been you know, built and established, or a company that a young person could run. And I think that is how, um, over the years, we've begun to sell our politics. It's not just about going to election, it's no, no, going it, it's to a vote movement, right? for, for a job. Yes. I want to vote for a job, I want to vote for um, 
basic mm -hmm. basic access to health yeah. um, or edu access to yes. education because I feel like university is too expensive mm -hmm. and this particular party um, their manifesto speaks about that but are there parties where you would say I mean of course you have no coming from your party but maybe ask Shandri also yeah. um, are there parties that address the youth specifically relative to others or is it more like a broader um, I consistent think, ignorance. I think everyone, every manifesto, that's always a divide between manifesto and implementation because yeah. it's easier to make promises. But manifesto is just, a, it's yeah. just a written saying, stuff. How do you well, I it? think if parties address youth, I'm saying every manifesto so far, especially in the last elections, mm. have had an element where they try to address it because it's the largest mm. demographic. Mm. But once again, manifestos, it's easier to make promises, Absolutely. it's harder to keep them. Mm. Uh, especially once you get into power and you understand that systems and processes might work differently than being able to do things within one or two years. Um, but, but I think it, it's not so much as parties speaking to young people, I think it's more, and you are a perfect example of that and the other MPs, it's more about bringing young people into the exactly. policy making yeah. and formation stages yes. so that they are part and parcel of that process and not just speaking down to them. No, no, but that's, I mean, I'm asking because in Germany we have this sense, and that's something I developed also in, in this podcast, yeah. uh, a lot of people have this idea of uh, African politics being often uh, dominated by tribalism to some extent, right? That the mm. certain parties are having a certain um, ethnic belonging and um, then of course it will not be so much about policy, like maybe, you know, in Germany left, central, right center. I mean, yeah. also we are not the most diverse, I agree. <laughs> but um, for sure, um, that is a stereotype that is still ongoing. And maybe yeah. to address that, um, is, there, is there something similar that you would say that um, we have certain political movements which are attached to ethnic groups or can there be maybe some, some form of movement that unites them all? And the youth is something. Every group has a youth, right? Uh, it doesn't matter the, the economic background. It doesn't matter the ethnic background. It could be a, a unity among, among a very diverse group. How do, how do you get that? I, I don't think it's about the biggest problem. Yes, political parties, historically in Namibia, political parties were formed along tribal lines. Okay ethnical lines that you, that you just spoke of. Uh, but I think even when we, I don't think uh, there's a problem with young people coming together from different tribes to form an idea or to pursue a particular uh, agenda mm -hmm. or push for an agenda. I think usually what the, the, the my, from my own personal experience is the biggest challenge is who leads us. It's a power struggle, really. It's not necessarily about you come from what tribe or I come from what tribe. Especially, I'm speaking particularly about young people here. Maybe that is present with the elders. I don't want to speak on behalf of those because I'm not there yet. Yes, yes. But um, when it comes to young people, it's usually, there's always a power struggle. Mm. And that power struggle goes, transcends ethnic lines or tribal lines. It's really about, but I want to be president and I want to be president. So that is where we are at right now. Mm. But I think in terms of consolidating ideas, Chandra and I have similar views about what we should do in terms of youth unemployment, even as people from different ethnic yes, lines. Yes, yes. What we should do in terms of, you know, redistribution of land, uh, what we should do in terms of, or how we even view inequality and inequity in our country. We do have those similar views. It's for me, it's about consolidating the views yes. and uh, transcending beyond just the views mm. and really coming to a conclusion to say, colleagues, let's move forward in this way. So I understand you correctly. It needs the organization, maybe, or maybe mm -hmm. some, I mean, in, in, take the green movement. I would say the most youth movement, maybe in the, the European context, there was this Greta Thunberg and suddenly everybody had someone they could really identify. And suddenly you see Germany plops up another Greta here. I mean, maybe is it then just about the, the structure and maybe a, a leading figure that, that could lead the change? No, I, I don't think it's necessarily about a leading figure that could lead the change, but I agree with, with Ina in the sense that there is a need to consolidate um, the, the power of the youth and the energy of the youth. Yeah. And I think with these existing structures, it often fragments us, right? That we want to rally behind identities, whether it's tribal identities, whether it's party identities, and to a certain extent also the rural-urban divide. You find that young people in rural areas uh, might not have the same priorities mm -hmm. as those in urban areas. Urban That's areas, true. it's more student accommodation, yeah. you know, immediate, uh, can I get a job yes. after I graduate? Mm -hmm. For a rural young person, that narrative might be very different. But I think it's important that 
we rally behind the idea of being youth yes. and understanding our role in terms of the future of this Yeah, country. the power you have. Yeah. I mean, you guys are the voters. You can decide who's in charge, right? Doesn't need to be the same. And, and, and we find that the, the, the hardest hit youth in our country are the rural youth. Yeah. Hmm. You know, and that is why um, their stories are so touching because you it, it goes beyond. And, and urban youth, for example, can offer to go and rake a yard and get some small money for bread. But the rural youth has to wake up milk cows. That's their story. And, um, and also in terms of access to information. Uh, access to information on opportunities, for example. The same opportunities or the same access to information that an urban youth would have compared to a rural youth is not the same. Mm -hmm. A rural youth would not have access to the internet, mm -hmm. would not have access to a television or a radio. So it's seldom very hard to, to, to find a rural youth doing better than an urban youth. But that divide, I think, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's upon us, Chandra, you and I, it's a challenge. Yes, yes. That no, it's, it's a very good point. And this is, I think, sometimes where we also come, come together in the sense that yes. this dominates also European politics, these anywheres and nowhere, I mean, somewheres and anywheres. You know, that you have a lot of global, um, progressive people in the big urban centers who are now mm -hmm. becoming vegan and You know, they are for public transportation and you don't even have to follow all of these ideas, but for sure it separates them strongly to the ones who have maybe some more of cultural belonging in the, yes. in the smaller regions. And yes. this divide fragmentizes politics even now in Germany. So I think um, if we find some solution to that, that could even unite uh, both of our, um, let's say, problems with politicalization of Of young people. But I was like uh, the, the participation in, uh, in Germany. I know um, my experience with young Germans, for mm -hmm. example, has been, you know, um, climate change. Yes. They're very strong in that, social movements and so forth. But is it like deeply politically entrenched? Or is it more on the political, uh, on the social side to say, um, we just want to protest for, on, for green energy, yes, yes. climate change and all that. For sure, uh, for sure. Not necessarily the politics. No, you're right. It, it, the biggest youth movement is for sure the, the, the Green, green Party, yes. how to say. Um, so, I mean, among first voters, we had elections now two years ago, um, among first voters, that was slightly the biggest one, together with the very um, liberal party, which is like the most pro-capitalist, yeah. pro, uh, pro um, let's say, financial independence and these things that maybe we can't address since our voter base is so old that they never want to touch, by example, the pension scheme, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, it is interestingly already quite quite divided, although I would say all of them have a much more strong liberal uh, liberal set of faith there, you know, like, I mean, the Greens are very ethnical and progressive and also the, yeah. the very uh, capitalist ones are leading towards these values, but um, that it doesn't translate since the, the share of them in the overall population is small and yeah. demographically um, we are not uh, uh, reversing those trends at, at any point. But um, yeah, maybe so lastly to, to, to get back a bit with, with your experiences from Germany, um, Have you been in touch maybe also with, uh, with youths in Germany or with your experiences from the political scene in Germany? What, what uh, did you get from that? Is there something that we can both work on together to, to face these challenges? Or maybe uh, what was your perception of your German trips? Well, I, I think um, one of the most important things that I like to pride myself is um, somebody said your network is your net worth. Um, and I think that's the most important thing for me. When you go to a meeting, I don't need to work out with an envelope of 10,000 <laughs> euros, you know. Uh, what is more important is those networks that I make. And one of the networks, which is quite interesting, um, we're working together now on a project that targets young farmers. Um, and so we are organizing a young farmers symposium here in Namibia with the support of this young German that I met oh. at that particular meeting. Because we felt that, you know, he is a, a strong advocate for green energy, you know, climate change and all that. And so he would, you know, when we spoke, his first instance was to say, it's so important to have for every farmer in an African country to have some sort of backyard where they grow their own vegetable because he's vegan again. Hey. So it, it really goes back to that. It's the interchanges, the cultural interchanges, the identity of sharing and sharing of ideas. So it's, he, he, he's just one of the many people that I actually met at that particular conference. We're also organizing other conferences mm -hmm. under the same um, umbrella organization. And, and that's, I think, also our main, main deal always, right? That we have this personal connection yeah. and from that then comes into you know, the heavy topics we've, yeah. we've And address together and yeah. then also I think this is the only chance that we might also find a common agreement because if you meet first the person and then the issue um, you, you want to also stay with that person in the sense of finding a personal agreement. Chandra, maybe for you, you also went to Germany in these different times. How was your perception yeah. of, the, of the youth in Germany? Well, definitely, I, I think that the German young people are becoming more conscious of yes. um, you know, the role that the country has played historically mm -hmm. and continues to play currently but I think that There is a lot more work needed to be done 
Um, I mean, for me, this sort of feels like a form of exceptionalism yeah. in terms of the relationship Frederick and I may have and the relationship you may have yeah. with this young German. Um, that there is a need to bring people closer together from cultural exchange yeah. um, and, and not just to prioritize the polity of it, but yeah. yes. so the basic day-to-day -day activities be between young people. So that once there's more exchange, we get to understand each other better. And mm -hmm. when, we, uh, when we do the architecture of this new frontier, we are able to um, really design a new relationship that will define our generation. Yes. And it's important that that particular conversation and that process takes place between young people from yes. Germany and young yeah. people from Namibia. Because most times it's been about the elders, the government exactly. leaders. Who identifies and, with that? Yeah, nobody identifies with that. But if we meet over a beer and we talk about, hey, mm -hmm. I think Namibia is great beer. No, I like what you like in, Ger mm -hmm. in Germany. Then that is the exchange that we can establish our foundation on. Honorable Ina, thank you very much for your participation. I thank think we so are, have a lot to talk about more, but this was yeah. a very insightful discussion. Thank you so much for discussion. having me. Yeah. It was a real pleasure. Yep. See you guys soon. <laughs>